So welcome everybody um, to our event celebrating Homer's Iliad. Um, I can just come and squeeze in over here. Um, and uh, we're going to start our reading of book six um, this evening with an extract from Ewan McLachlan's um, Scots Gaelic translation um, from the early 19th century. Ewan McLachlan was librarian at this university um, for the first um, 18 years of the 19th century. And my colleague Michelle McLeod will read some extract from book six. Pushed flat the barren fervor mock, Tarasolus a yard line. Ye who yell press a week, Knai and Yamab and the hard scars. Swoich the hook air of straw, Nam now from the horse moor. A three from Rouge a head eye, Strong laundry a yard of hooey. Strong two bar, vapor of glass. Cachrahuich me viach na dos, gar e charech go firach, me ni bechant bad on his. En shin he kluch viri me glaum, en tur e doch fadahi, slek de sokre en bau traum, e beishke kan war en ei. Risht me thog e wicht en grai, schok en me da wai de kurs, rastlich e moor vi me niel, se afjem. Und Eir troich ne hülgür, hüg an Glöchse et ahet bar. Kriye wahet hart gach che, ne ebnes an jem ne kliev, s awet kiem skürtje gach biol, ne schien arisch skiol die biel. En schön ne dür biach gehör, raschig e beck me garu, chüde se biol die gau hich, e buch gspieschi men schäf hür. Regien schön zu Kloss hab, Schlaube le Gar ere Glon Grüsch, Ach Lön vier wird jen genial, Tüch ne Gion, Vor wie all Hür Hü. Brüch ne Kaum Krien Krien, Lach ge jeg ne Bees der Wei, Hier be mi Druch Gott to Brüei, Slecke Smure le Keitsch Klar. Thank you very much, that was beautiful. And that was um, the, uh, the parting of Hector and Dungolkin in Scots Gaelic, for those of you who um, <laughs> don't understand enough Gaelic like my son to recognize it. Um, all right, um, so now we are going to read through Richmond Lashmore's English translation of book six. <coughs> so, the grim encounter of Chiaans and Trojans was left to itself, and the battle veered greatly, now one way, now in another. Over the plain, as they guided their bronze spears at each other, in the place between the waters of Xanthos and Simois. First, Telamonian Ias, that bastion of the Achaeans, broke the Trojan battalions and brought light to his own company. Striking down the man, who was far the best of the Thracians, Achaemath, the huge and mighty, the son of Eusoros. Throwing first, he struck the horn of the horse-haired helmet and the bronze spear point fixed in his forehead and drove inward through the bone. And a mist of darkness clouded both eyes. Diomedes of the great war cry cut down Axelos, Teuthras' son, who had been a dweller in strong founded Arisbe a man rich in substance and a friend to all humanity, since in his house by the wayside he entertained all comers. Yet there was none of those now to stand before him and keep off the sad destruction, and Diomedes stripped life from both of them, Axelos and his henchman Calesios, who was the driver guiding his horses. So down to the underworld went both men. Now Euryalus slaughtered Ophelteos and Dresos, 
and went in pursuit of Isephos and Pedasos, those whom the Naiad nymph Arbavare had borne to blameless Bucolion. Bucolion himself was the son of How Haughty Laomedon, eldest born, but his mother conceived him in darkness and secrecy. While shepherding his flocks, he lay with the nymph and loved her, and she conceiving bore him twin boys. But now, Machisios' son unstrung the strength of these and the limbs in their glory, Euryalos, and stripped the armor away from their shoulders. Polypoetes the stubborn in battle cut down Astyalos, while Odysseus slaughtered one from Percote, Pedites, with a bronze spear, and great Aration was killed by Teucros. Nestor's son Antilochus, with the shining shaft, killed Ableros. The lord of men, Agamemnon, brought death to Alatos, whose home had been on the shores of Sophniao's lovely water, sheer Pedasos. And Laetos, the fighter, caught Philokos as he ran away, and Eurypylos made an end of Melanthius. Now Menelaus, with the great war cry, captured Adrestos alive, for his two horses, bolting over the level land, got entangled in a tamarisk grove, and shattered the curving chariot at the tip of the pole. So they, broken free, went on towards the city, where many besides stampeded in terror. So Adrestus was whirled beside the wheels of the chariot, headlong into the dust on his face, and the son of Atreus, Menelaus, with the far shadowed spear in his hand, stood over him. But Adrestus, catching him by the knees, supplicated, Take me alive, son of Atreus, and take appropriate ransom. In my rich father's house, the treasures lie piled in abundance, bronzes layer of gold, and difficultly wrought iron and my father would make you glad with abundant repayment were he to hear that I am alive by the ships of the Achaeans. So he spoke and moved the spirit inside Menelaus, and now he was on the point of handing him to a henchman to lead back to the past Achaean ships. But Agamemnon came on the run to join him and spoke his word of argument. Dear brother, O Menelaus, are you so tenderly with these people? Did you in your house get the best of treatment from the Trojans? No, let not one of them go free of some death on our hands. Not the young man child that the mother carries still in her body, not even he, but let all of Ilion's people perish, utterly blotted out and unmourned for. The hero spoke like this and bent the heart of his brother, since he urged justice. Menelaus shoved with his hand and restless the warrior back from him, and powerful Agamemnon stabbed him in the side as he writhed over it. Atreides, setting his heel upon the midriff, wrenched out the ash spear. Nestor, in a great voice, cried out to the men of Argos, O oh, beloved Danaean fighters, henchmen of Ares, let no man any more hang back with his eye on the plunder, designing to take all the spoil he can gather back to the vessels. Let us kill the men now, and afterward, at your leisure, all along the plain, you can plunder the perished corpses. So he spoke and stirred the spirit and strength in each man. Then once more did the Trojans have climbed back into Ilion's wall, subdued by terror before the warlike Achaeans. Had not Priam's son, Helenus, by, best by far of the augurs, stood beside Aeneas and Hector and spoken a word to them. Hector and Aeneas, on you beyond others is leaning the battle war of the Trojans and Achaeans. Since you are our greatest in every course we take, whether it be thought or in fighting, stand your ground here, visit your people everywhere, hold them fast by the gates before they tumble into their women's arms and become our, to our enemies a thing they give dirty. Afterward, when you have set all the battalions in motion, the rest of us will stand fast here and fight with the Danaeans, though we are very, very hard hit indeed. Necessity forces us, but you, Hector, go back again to the city and tell there your mother and mine to assemble all the Lady of Honours at the temple of Grey Isle Athene, high on the citadel. There, opening with a key the door of the sacred chamber, let her take a robe, which seems to her the largest and the loveliest in the great house, 
and that which is far her dearest possession, and lay it along the knees of Athene, the lovely hair. Let her promise to dedicate within the shrine twelve pipers, yearlings, never broken, if only she will have pity on the town of Troy and the children's wives and, the innocent, and their innocent children. So she might hold back from the sacred Ilion, the son of Tydeus, that wild spear fighter, the, stronger, the strong one who drives men to thoughts of terror, who, say, who I say now is become the strongest of all the Achaeans, for never did we so fear Achilleus even, that leader of men, who they say was born to of a goddess. This man has gone clean further, so that no one can match his warcraft against him. So he spoke, and Hector did not disobey his brother. But at once, in all armor, leapt to the ground from his chariot, and shaking two sharp spears in his hands, raged over the whole host, steering them up to fight and walking to the ghastly warfare. So they whirled about and stood their grounds against the Achaeans, and the Argives gave way backward and stopped their slaughtering and thought someone of the immortal must have descended from the starry sky to stand by his Trojans the way they rallied. But, but Hector lifted his voice and cried out to the Trojans, you high-hearted Trojans and far-renowned companions, be men now, dear friends, and remember your furious father until I can go back again to Ilium and then tell the elder men who sit as counselors and our wives to make their prayer to the immortals and promise them hecatombs. So, uh, so spoke Hector of the shining helm and departed, and against his ankles and against his neck clasped the dark ox hide, the rim running round the edge of the great shield, massive in the middle. Now Glaucus, sprung of Hippolycus, and the son of Tydeus, came together in the space between the two armies, battle bent. Now, as these advancing came to one place and encountered, first to speak was Diomedes of the great war cry. Who among mortal men are you, good friend? <coughs> Since never before have I seen you in fighting where men win glory. Yet now you have come striding far out in front of all others in your great heart, who have dared stand up to my spear, far shadowing. Yet unhappy are those whose sons match warcraft against me. But if you are someone of the immortals come down from the bright sky, know that I will not fight against any god of the heavens since even the son of Dryas, Lycurgus the powerful, did not, did not live long. He who tried to fight with the gods of the bright sky, who once rode the fosterers of rapturous Dionysus, headlong down the sacred Nicaean hill, and all of them shed and scattered their wands on the ground, stricken with an ox bow by murderous Lycurgus, while Dionysus, in terror, dived into the salt surf, and Thetis took him to her bosom, frightened, with the strong shivers upon him at the man's blustering. But the gods, who live at their ease, were angered with Lycurgus, and the son of Cronus struck him to blindness. Nor did he live long afterward, since he was hated by all the immortals. Therefore neither would I be willing to fight with the blessed, with the blessed gods. But if you are one of those mortals who eat what the soil yields, come nearer, so that sooner you may reach your appointed destruction. And then in turn, the shining son of Hippolochus answered, I, heart of son of Titus, I ask of my generation, as is the generation of leaves, so is that of humanity. The wind scatters the leaves on the ground, but the live timber burgeons and leaves again in the season of spring returning. So one generation of men will grow while another dies. <coughs> Yet if you wish to learn all this and be certain of my genealogy, there are plenty of men who do it. There is a city, a fiery in the corner of horse pasture in Argos, and there lived Sisyphus, that sharpest of all men, Sisyphus Aeolus' son, and he had a son named Glaucus, and Glaucus in turn sired Bellerbontes the blameless. 
to build our fontes that God's granted beauty and desirable manhood. But Proetus and anger devised evil things against him, and drove him out of his own domain, since he was far greater. From the Argive country, his use had broken to the sway of the scepter. Beautiful Antea, the wife of Proetus, was stricken with passion to lie in love with him, and yet she would not beguile the valiant Bellerophontes, whose will was virtuous. And so she went to Proetus the king and uttered her falsehood. Would you be killed, O Proetus? Then murder Bellerophontes, who tried to lie with me in love, though I was unwilling. And so she spoke, and anger took hold of the king at her story. He shrank from killing him, since his heart was awed by such action but sent him away to Lycia and handed him murderous symbols, which he inscribed in a folding tablet enough to destroy life, and told him to show it to his wife's father, that he might perish. Bellerophontes went to Lycia and the this convoy of the gods. When he came to the running stream of Xanthos in Lycia, the lord of white Lycia rendered him full-hearted honour. Nine days he entertained him with sacrifice of nine oxen, but afterwards, when the rose fingers of the temple on shore, then he began to question him and ask to be shown the symbols, whatever he might be carrying from his son-in-law, Reuters. And then after he'd been given his son-in-law's wicked symbols, first he sent him away with orders to kill the Chimaira. None might approach a thing, an immortal, make not human, lying fronted and snake behind, a goat in the middle, and snorting out the breath of the terrible flame of bright fire. He killed the Chimaira, obeying the portents of the mortals, and next after this he fought against the glorious Solomoi, and this he thought was the strongest battle with men that he entered. But third he slaughtered the Amazons, who fight men in battle. Now as he came back, the king spun another entangling treachery, for choosing the bravest men in white the he laid the trap. But these men never came home thereafter, since all of them were killed by blameless Bellerophontes. Then, when the king knew him, for the powerful stock of the gods, he detained him there and offered him the hand of his daughter, and gave him half of all the kingly privilege. There too the men of Lycia cut out a piece of land, surpassing all others, fine plough land and orchard for him to administer. His bride bore three children to valiant Florifontes, Isandros and Hippolochus and Lardinea. Lardinea lay in love besides use of the councils and bore him in godlike Sarpedon of the brazen helmet. But after the Lerophontes was hated by all the immortals, he wandered alone by long the plain of Aleos, eating his heart out, skulking aside from the trodden track of humanity. And as for Xandros his son, Ares, the insatiate of fighting, killed him in close battle against the glorious Solomoi, while Artemis of the golden reins killed the daughter in anger. But Hippolochus, the gods mean, and I claim that he is my father, he sent me to Troy, and urged upon me repeated injunctions, to be always amongst the bravest and hold my head above the others, not shaming the generations of my fathers, who were the greatest men in fiery and again in white Lycia. Such is my generation and the blood I claim to be born from. He spoke, and the Amenes of the great war cry was gladdened. He drove his spear deep in the prospering earth, and in winning words of friendliness he spoke to the shepherd of the people. See now, you are my guest friend from far in the time of our fathers. Brilliant Toynius was once host to Bellerophontes the blameless in his halls, and twenty days he detained him, and these two gave to each other fine gifts and token of friendship. Toynius gave his guests the war belt, bright with the red dye, Bellerophontes a gold and a double-handed drinking cup, a thing I left behind in my house when I came on my journey. Tidious, though I cannot remember, since I was little when he left me, that time the people of the Achaeans perished in Thebe. For I am your friend and host in the heart of Argos, and you are mine in Lycia when I come to your country. Let us avoid each other's spears, even with close fighting. There are plenty of Trojans and famed companions in battle for me to kill, whom the god sends me, or those I run down with my swift feet. Many Achaeans for you thought that we could do it. But let us exchange our armour, so that these others may know how we claim to be guests and friends from the days of our fathers. And so they spoke. Both spring down from behind their horses, gripped each other's hands, and exchanged the promise of friendship. But Zeus, the son of Cronos, fell away the wits of Lurcus, who exchanged with Diomedes, the son of Tydeus, armour, over gold for bronze, for nine oxen's worth the worth of a hundred. Now, as Hector had come to the sky and gates and the oak tree, 
all the wives of the Trojans and their daughters came running about him to ask after their sons, after their brothers and neighbors, their husbands. And he told them to pray to the immortals all in turn, but there were sorrows in store for many. Now he entered the wonderfully built palace of Priam. This was fashioned with smooth stone cloister walks, and within it were embodied 50 sleeping chambers of smooth stone, built so as to connect with each other. And within these slept each beside his own wedded wife, the sons of Priam. In the same inner court on the opposite side, to face these, lay the 12 close smooth stone sleeping chambers of his daughters, built so as to connect with each other. And within these slept, each by his own modest wife, the lords of the daughters of Priam. There there came to meet Hector, his bountiful mother, with Laodice, the loveliest looking of all her daughters. She clung to his hand and called him by name and spoke to him. Why then, child, have you come here and left behind the bold battle? Surely it is these accursed sons of the Achaeans who wear you out as they fight close to the city, and the spirit stirred you to return, and from the peak of the citadel lift your hands, praying to Zeus. But stay while I bring you honey-sweet wine to pour out a libation to Father Zeus and the other immortals first, and afterward, if you will drink yourself, be strengthened. In a tired man, wine will bring back his strength to its bigness. In a man tired as you are tired, defending your neighbors. Tall Hector of the shining helm spoke to her, answering, My honored mother, lift not to me the kindly sweet wine, for fear you stagger my strength and make me forget my courage. And with hands unwashed, I would take shame to pour the glittering wine to Zeus. There is no means for a man to pray to the dark misted son of Kronos with blood and muck <coughs> all spattered upon him. But go yourself to the temple of the spoiler Athene, assembling the ladies of honor and with things to be sacrificed, and take a robe which seems to you the largest and loveliest in the great house and that which is far your dearest possession. Lay this along the knees of Athene the lovely-haired. Also, promise to dedicate within the shrine twelve heifers, yearlings never broken, if only she will have pity on the town of Troy, and the Trojan wives and their innocent children, if she will hold back from sacred Ilion, the son of Tydeus, that wild spear-fighter, the strong one who drives men to thoughts of terror. So go yourself to the temple of the spoiler Athene, while I go in search of Paris to call him, if he will listen to anything I tell him. How I wish at this moment the earth might open beneath him. The Olympian let him live, a great sorrow to the Trojans, and high-hearted Priam and all of his children. If only I could see him gone down to the house of the death god, then I could say my heart had forgotten its joyless affliction. <clears throat> so he spoke, and she, and she, going into the great house, called out to her handmaidens, who assembled through the city, her, the high-born women, while she descended into the fragrant store chamber. There lay the elaborately wrought robes, the work of Sidonian women, whom Alexandros himself, the godlike, had brought home from the land of Sidon, crossing the wide sea on that journey when he brought back also gloriously descended Helen. Hecabe lifted out one and took it as gift to Athene, that which was the loveliest in design and the largest and shone like a star. It lay beneath the others. She went on her way, and a throng of noble women hastened about her. When these had come to Athene's temple on the peak of the <coughs> citadel, Theano of the fair cheeks opened the door for them, daughter of Chiseus and wife of Antenor, breaker of horses, she whom the Trojans had established to be Athene's prince priestess. 
With a wailing cry, all lifted up their hands to Athene, and Theano of the fair cheeks, taking up the robe, laid it along the knees of Athene, the lovely haired, and praying, she supplicated the daughter of powerful Zeus. O lady, Athene, our city's defender, shining among goddesses, break the spear of Diomedes, and grant that the man be hurled on his face in front of the Scyan gates. So may we instantly dedicate within your shrine twelve heifers, yearlings never broken, if only you will have pity on the town of Troy and the Trojan wives and their innocent children. She spoke in prayer, but Pallas Athene turned her head from her. So they made their prayer to the daughter of Zeus the Powerful, but Hector went away to the house of Alexandros, a splendid place he had built himself with the men who at the time were the best men for craftsmanship in the generous Troad, who had made him a sleeping room and a hall and a courtyard near the houses of Hector and Priam on the peak of the citadel. There entered Hector, beloved of Zeus, in his hand holding the eleven cubit long spear, whose shaft was tipped with a shining bronze spearhead, and a ring of gold was hooped to hold it. He found the man in his chamber, busy with his splendid armour, the corslet and the shield, and turning in his hands the curved bow, while Helen of Argos was sitting among her attendant women, directing the magnificent work done by her handmaidens. But Hector saw him, and in words of strength he rebuked him. Strange man, it is not fair to keep him your heart as cold. The people are dying around the city and around the steep wall as they fight hard. And it is for you that this war with its clamour has flared up without that time. You yourself would fight with another whom you saw anywhere hanging back from the hateful encounter. Up then, to keep our town from burning at once in the hot fire. Then in answer, the godlike Alexander spoke to him. Hector, seeing that you have scolded me rightly, not beyond measure, therefore I will tell, and you in turn understand and listen. It was not so much in coldness and bitter will towards the Trojans that I sat in my room but I wish to give myself over to sorrow. But just now, with soft words, my wife was winning me over and urging me into the fight, and that way seems to me also the better route. Victory passes back and forth between men. Come then, wait for me now while I put on my armor of battle, or go, and I will follow, and I think I can overtake you. He spoke, but Hector of the Shining Helm gave him no answer. But Helen spoke to him in words of endearment. Brother, why marriage to me? Oh, my nasty bitch, evil, intriguing. How I wish that on that day when my mother first bore me the foul whirlwind of the storm had caught me away and swept me to the mountain or into the wash of the sea, deep thundering, where the waves would have swept me away before all these things had happened. Yet since the gods have brought it about that these vile things must be, I wish I had been a wife of a better man than this is, one who knew modesty and all things of shame, as men said. But this man's heart is no steadfast thing nor yet will it be so ever hereafter. For that I think he shall take the consequence. But come now, come in and rest on this chair, my brother, since it is on your heart, beyond all, that the hard work has fallen for the sake of dishonored me and the blind act of Alexander's. Us too, on whom Zeus set a vile destiny, so that hereafter we shall be made into kings of song for the men of the future. Then tall Hector of the shining helm answered her, do not, Helen, make me sick of you, though you love me. You will not dissuade me. Already my heart within is hastening me to defend the Trojan, who, when I am away, long greatly to have me. Rather rouse this man, and let himself also be swift to action, so he may overtake me while I am still in the city. For I am going first to my own house, so I can visit my own people, my beloved wife and my son, who is little, since I do not know if ever again I shall come back this way or whether the gods will strike me down at the hands of the Achaean. So speaking, Hector of the Shining Hell departed, and in speed made his way with his own well-established dwelling, but failed to find in the house of uh, house Andromache of the White Arms. For she, with child and followed by one fair road attendant, had taken her place in the tower in lamentation, when he saw no sign of his perfect wife within the house, Hector stopped in his way on the threshold and spoke among the handmaidens. Come then, tell me truthfully as you may, handmaidens. Where has Andromache of the 
white arms gone? Is she with the sisters of the Lord or the wives of his brothers? Or has she gone to the house of Athena, where all the other lovely haired women of Troy perpetuate the green goddess? Then, in turn, the hard working housekeeper gave him an answer. Hector, since you have urged me to tell you the truth, she is not with any of the sisters of her lord or the wives of his brothers, nor has she gone to the house of Athene, where all the other lovely haired women of Troy perpetuate the grim goddess. But she has gone to the great bastion of Ilium, because she has heard that the Trojans are losing, and the great grew the strength of the Achaeans. Therefore she has gone in speed to the wall, like a woman gone mad, and the nurse intending her carries the baby. Oh, so the housekeeper spoke, and Hector hastened from his home backward um, by the way he had come through the world aged streets. So as he had come to the gates on his way through the great city, the skiing gates, where she would issue into the plain, there at last his own generous wife came running to meet him. Andromache, the daughter of the high altered um, Ateo, a dame who had dwelt underneath wooded Placos in um, Thebe, below Placos, lord of the Kikian people. It was his lovely daughter who had, um, was given to Hector of the bronze helm. She came to him there, and beside her went her attendant carrying the boy in the fold of her a lovely child, only a baby, Hector's son, the admired, beautiful as a star shining. And when Hector calls for Mandarius, but all of the others, Ascinax, Lord of the city, since Hector alone saved. Hector smiled in silence as he looked on his son, but she, Andromache, stood close beside him, letting her tears fall, and clung to his hand and called him by name and spoke to him. Dearest, your own great strength will be your death, and you have no pity on your little son, nor on me, ill-starred, who soon must be your widow. For presently the Achaeans, gathering together, will set upon you and kill you, and for me, it would be far better to sink into the earth when I have lost you, for there is no other consolation for me after you have gone to your destiny. Only grief, since I have no father, no honored mother. It was brilliant Achilles who slew my father, Aetion, when he stormed the strong-founded citadel of the Calicians, Phoebe of the towering gates. He killed Aetion, but did not strip his armor, for his heart respected the dead man, but burned the body in all its elaborate war gear and piled a grave mound over it. And the nymphs of the mountains, daughters of Zeus of the Aegis, planted elm trees about it. And they who were my seven brothers in the great house all went upon a single day down into the house of the death god. For swift-footed, brilliant Achilles slaughtered all of them as they were tending their white sheep and their lumbering oxen. And when he had led my mother, who was queen under wooded Placos, here along with all his other possessions, Achilles released her again, accepting one ransom beyond count. But Artemis of the showering arrows struck her down in the halls of her father. Hector, thus you are father to me and my honored mother. You are my brother, and you it is who are my young husband. Please take pity upon me then, Stay here on the rampart, that you may not leave your child an orphan, your wife a widow, but draw your people up by the fig tree, there where the city is openest to attack, and where the wall may be mounted. Three times their bravest came that way, and fought there to storm it, about the two Iantes, and renowned Dominaeus, about the two Atreidae, and the fighting son of Tydeus. Either some man well skilled in prophetic arts has spoken, or the very spirit within themselves had stirred them to the onslaught. 
Then tall Hector of the shining helm answered her. All these things are in my mind also, lady. Yet I would feel deep shame before the Trojans and the Trojan women with trailing garments, if, like a coward, I were to shrink aside from the fighting. And the spirit will not let me, since I have learned to be valiant and to fight always amongst the foremost ranks of the Trojans, winning for my own self great glory and for my father. For I know this thing well in my heart, and my mind knows it. There will come a day when sacred Ilion shall perish, and Priam and the people of Priam of the strong ash spear. But it is not so much the pain to come of the Trojans that troubles me, not even of Priam the king, nor Hecabe, nor the thought of my brothers, who in their numbers and valor shall drop in the dust under the hands of men who hate them. As troubles me the thought of you, when some bronze-armored Achaean leads you off, taking away your day of liberty in tears, and in Argos you must work at the loom of another, and carry water from the spring Messaeus or Hyperea, all unwilling, but strong will be the necessity upon you. And some day, seeing you shedding tears, a man will say of you, this is the wife of Hector, who was ever the bravest fighter of the Trojans, breakers of horses, in the days when they fought about Ilion. So will one speak of you, and for you it will be yet a fresh grief to be widowed of such a man who could fight off the day of your slavery. But may I be dead, and the piled earth hide me under, before I hear you crying, and know by this that they drag you captive. So speaking, glorious Hector held out his arms to his baby, who shrank back to his fair girdled nurse's bosom, screaming and frightened at the aspect of his own father, terrified as he saw the bronze and the crest with its horsehair, nodding dreadfully, as he thought, from the peak of the helmet. Then his beloved father laughed out, and his honored mother, and at once glorious Hector lifted from his head the helmet and laid it in all its shining upon the ground. Then taking up his dear son, he tossed him about in his arms and kissed him and lifted his voice in prayer to Zeus and the other immortals. Zeus and you other immortals, grant that this boy who is my son may be as I am, preeminent among the Trojans, great in strength as I am, and rule strongly over Ilion. And some day, let them say of him, he is better by far than his father, as he comes in from the fighting. And let him kill his enemy, and bring home the blooded spoils, and delight the heart of his mother. So speaking, he set his child again in the arms of his beloved wife, who took him back again to her fragrant bosom, smiling in her tears. And her husband saw and took pity upon her, and stroked her with his hand, and called her by name and spoke to her. Poor Andromache, why does your heart sorrow so much for me? No man is going to hurl me to Hades unless it is fated. But as for fate, I think that no man yet has escaped it once it has taken its first form, neither brave man nor coward. Go therefore back to, your house, to our house and take up your own work, the loom and the distaff and see to it that your handmaidens buy their work also. But the men must see to the fighting, all men who are the people of Ilion, but I beyond others. So glorious Hector spoke, and again took up the helmet with its crest of horse hair, while his beloved wife went homeward, turning to look back on the way, letting the live tears fall. And as she came in speed into the well-settled household of Hector, the slayer of men, she found numbers of handmaidens within, and her coming stirred all of them into lamentation. So they mourned in his house over Hector while he was living still, for they thought he would never come back from the fighting alive, escaping the Achaean hands and their violence. But Paris in turn did not linger long in his high house, but when he had put on his glorious armor with bronze elaborate, he ran in the confidence of his quick feet through the city, as when some stalled horse who has been corn-fed at the manger, breaking free of his rope, gallops over the plain in thunder to his accustomed bathing place in a sweet running river, 
and in the pride of his strength holds high his head, and the mane floats over his shoulders. Sure of his glorious strength, the quick knees carry him to the loved places and the pasture of horses. So from uttermost Pergamos came Paris, the son of Priam, shining in all his armor of war as the sun shines, laughing aloud, and his quick feet carried him. Suddenly thereafter, he came on brilliant Hector, his brother, where he yet lingered before turning away from the place where he had talked with his lady. It was Alexandros the godlike who first spoke to him. Brother, I fear that I have held back your haste by being slow on the way, not coming in time as you commanded me. Then tall Hector of the shining helm spoke to him and answered, Strange man, there is no way that one giving judgment and fairness could dishonor your work in battle since you are a strong man. But of your own accord you hang back unwilling, and my heart is grieved in its thought when I hear shameful things spoken about you by the Trojans who undergo hard fighting for your sake. Let us go now. Some day hereafter we will make all right with the immortal gods in the sky if Zeus ever granted, sending up to them in our houses the wine bowl of liberty after we have driven out of Troy the strong greed of Thank you very much. Um, and to finish, um, my colleague Derek McClure is going to read an extract from a Scots translation of Book Six um, as a kind of a, an answer to the Gallic translation that he opened with. <coughs> this is by Douglas Young, who is a professor of classics here for a while. Hector's twine and fear drama. Sign when he came to the sky and yet as he gave through the borough. When he began to gae under the port on his way to the Howland, there his wheel took a life and drummach a count of them grinning. King Aetheon's daughter that was, great hearted and namely, all the Aetheon's cell that owned in wheel were at Placos, under Ben Placos and Phoebe, Cilician folk was his people. His ye daughter it was that was married on Hector the Breastgrave. Long time she came to meet him, a hoost coin follow at Efter, Hodden the bairn to her beast, just a wee bit tappetless bairn, Hector's bairn that he wooed, that was bonny as the end of the stars. Hector would call him Scamandrius, aye, but a Styanax measly already met him, a lane that was Hector was saw in the city. Lochly then he looked at his bairn, looked Lochin but spak not, stonin aside him his wife and draw a grant, and we greet him drop at his horn, and called him by name, and spat to him, Sarah. Fie that ye are, your nicht will be death to you. Never your bairn he tak ye thought to have all, or your wife again, and he that will sin be widowed to ye. The Achaean tables of sin he is slaughtered, or in the non ye are kins. And ye gefear us at time ye, better for me to ge under the yer. For never another son us our ken, when ye shall dree your beard that is weirded, Nathan but do. Nay, feather I hae, nor lady but mither. Na, na, lang syne, feather was slaughtered by godlike Achilles, him that harried the threatful brock of the Falcus of Lizzie. Phoebe, a heath begat ports, and the Aetheon's cell, the doon harrowed. Brave not the great thorn, though, but respected him to his honour. Brunt his corp on a pyre, with his weapons bonnily ruin him. Begit a cairn to him, tae. The nymphs that worn in the healings planted elms over in it, the daughters was used for the eggs. I and at hame thon time I had seen and be there about me. Och, but the hame of them gave thon ilk ye day and unto Hades. Oh, and ye too he slew, the fiery fit godlike Achilles, there with their shuffling cry and the yows with the kenspeckled fleshes. Mither for by, that was queen, our thunder by wheel with it like us. Her he brought here one time, with the lay of the gear that he harried, sign that her gear wa him for a ransom fairly past Putin. Doing in her father's hall, it was Archerus Artemis strike her. Hector, ye knew a lane and my father and me to the nether. Ye are my brother lane, for by the raw land are deadly. Come awa, cannily you, tack tent and fire on the tour. Mack the your beard the northern wane. 
and your life there with it. Battle your fight till the fifth of the fig tree, for they may steal up easiest into the broch, and run in where the wall has been built. Thrice doon by the assayed, and on for all with the wail of their fechters, run they twa they call Aias, and kin speck Lydionaneus, run the twa sons of King Atreus, and Tadeus is fear of King Barry, but Tadeus is fear of King Barry. Avons are chill with sick and sick to gain them a turn. Avons they live it in thoughts of their aim, and canny devisons. Son, Muggle Hector answered her, we are passing at Skinkland. Wife, it's me you'll take ten to your own one. But I'm fairly afflicted what'll be said by the men folk at Troy and the lion skirted demon. How did a wog and I bide like a smellless gift in the battle? Na, my herb says me na. I was glad I to be worthy. For in his thigh in the fecht and among the prime of the Troy men, when and renewed to my favour, and Miko renewed to my own cell. Weel I can this to my heart. And my engine tells me it truly. Tides are the tide when Elias tuned at his aliens on Paris. Cry and tea and the Fauca King cry and did with the ash spear. Lest for all that am I fast by on duel that the Trojans are in me, neither in Hecate's duel that's my mother, or duel King Priam, neither my brother's weird that for all their money and bonny, doon shall fall on the stoor and thee at the hands of their payment. Less for all there nor for thee. On some breast sack of Achaean, bugs you greet in a war, that can fee you the air your freedom. Yonder in our best sign, you'll tempt the loom to another. Run to the well in the sea, Sablons, or far Hyperia. Sayer and Athena front it, a strang lured near the beyond. Ablons, a body will say that sees you greeting too sailly, Donian's Hector's wife, him that was I the whale of the fetters. Troyland's ball several years, when for Ilias tuned did it battle. Stick my cable and still say, and a new duel then will be on you. One to a man might need to keep off you the season of travel. Gods, when I'm deed, in the murlet moves I must be yirded, or as I hear you a screech of distress, and your way from his genin. Says that Jester and Hector, and racks with his horn to his bend. Och, but the way would scroch. Slanting back on the breast to his nurse, fairly the furet he was, the sick to his daddy that blew him, flag it say at the breast, and the crest to his wallop and horse here, kelter and doon to the tap of the bassinet, uncle the sick to it. Lying then the bath of the mook, his dad and the lady his mother. Sign the rejecter and Hector releases his knee to the helmet, doon put it then on the broom dirt yelt, for it one of the stinkle. Kissing the beard that he wooed, and dand on to me in his arms, spat he a prayer recht hearty to Zeus and the labour of the god eats. Zeus and all other gods, let this bairnicky be like my ain cell, therefore like me in his micht, and the maester of Elias Barra. Sign may somebody say he's better a sick by his favour, when he comes up to the war. May he come with weapons all bloody, great though a foe he's slain, and the hair to his mother be plighted. Sick lights back he and least ye back his son to his wifey, into her hen that he would. At her breast she had with him sadly, walking and greeting at yet. And her man was ruth at the sick door, straight at her then ways gone, and spat to her puthy and earthly. Henny, dinner be fast, thou sail it for me in your sweet day. Nay, man will send me to hell in his near a time of his weirdit. Nay, man, truly I tell you, so thee flee for his weird that is weirded. Neither the gift nor the good man, the weird that is his for his birth time. Now you man gang a walk in, and tuck tin to your own kind of jobbies, merely go a loom and a way. And see that the lasses are riding, tent on their walk. The war and the battle, the men of that tent of, ye have been all, and the lay that are bare me so ill as Says back Jester and Hector, and lifts it the bassinet lightly. Horse here cresteth an all, and his dear wife gave a walk in with, turning often to look at her man, I greet him through sailing.
apologise for having taken so much of the reading myself because a couple of the readers we were expecting didn't turn up and I didn't realise this until they were actually due to start <coughs> speaking, so I sort of leapt in there. So apologies you had to put up with so much of my voice um, and rather than hearing more from, from our other wonderful readers with their amazing pronunciation of Greek names, which I always get wrong myself. Um, but uh, and thank you to our readers and thank you also to our audience um, for coming and, and helping us to, to celebrate um, Homer and the Iliad, which um, I, I really, I feel as if we, uh, there's such a, 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 a huge upwelling of love for Homer in this room and it was, it was so inspiring to hear a whole book all the way through aloud, um, which is such a, a rare event these days. Um, and it only remains for me to say that um, this event is a kind of prelude to um, the setting up of an Aberdeen branch of the Classical Association of Scotland, which I hope will be organising similar and very different events that all classics related um, over the years to come. Um, I'm going to be sending out an announcement um, about uh, an initial meeting um, where we're going to agree on our constitution for this local branch. If anybody here is interested in being in this from the start and doesn't yet know about it, then please drop me an email because um, it, would be, uh, it would be absolutely um, fine for me to, um, to include you. What am I trying to say? I would love to, to involve as many people as possible, so um, I'll, I'll then keep you posted about those events and that meeting. Um, so thank you once again to everybody. Um, and a final round of applause, I think. So yes, I was just about to say, I just remembered that. Um, we didn't really have time to have a proper go at the, the wine and olives before we started. So, you know, I think we have to room until 8 o'clock. So there's, there's time to drink and eat some more, if you would like to. We now have some extra glasses.